thank you for joining us today. My name is Kim Hiltwine, and I am the Assistant Director of Operations and Special Events here at the Pritzker Military Museum and Library. Um, I was really excited today to join you in talking about my favorite watch on the market, the Tank Watch by Cartier. Uh, before my time at the PMML, I worked in auction houses and evaluated jewelry and watches as a fine jewelry and watch specialist. So this is kind of the only thing I know about military history, and I'd love to share it with you today. And we are going to start with the history of Louis Cartier and the tank watch. And that history starts with a bang. In 2017, the highest priced tank sold at auction at Christie's for $379,000. $500. That is three times the auction estimate. And one would ask why? Well, we have a couple things going on. A, you can see on the provenance here that it was owned by Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis. But that's one of the reasons it was so iconic. Another is because it is the actual tank. And who purchased this? None other than Kim Kardashian. And she wore it when she visited the White House to talk to the president about prison reform because she said it would give her some power. Now, what power does this watch have? I mean, yes, it was Jackie's, but there's so much more to the tank watch than just being a celebrity icon. Louis Cartier had an expression that a good idea is an idea that gives birth to the evolution of something. So today we are actually gonna take a look at the evolution of the tank watch in terms of military history, in terms of jewelry history, and see why it is so important to talk about and is worth being talked about. Louis-Francois Cartier founded Cartier in 1847 in Paris. He started a shop and was a jeweler and was very successful. He brought his son, Albert, in. This is his son, Albert, and this is their first store on Rue de la Paix. In 1874, Albert joined the firm, and their biggest clients were European royalty. So much like Van Cleef, much like these old jewelry house names, they started with royal jewelry. The garland style would become their trademark of the time, uh, during Belle Epoque and with these royals. And Princess Mathilde, who is the niece of Napoleon I, and Empress Eugenie, who is Napoleon III's wife, were some of their most prominent clients. And you will see there that she is all decked out in her jewelry. And this was of the time. If you were royal, you displayed your wealth. You had these beautiful pieces. And Cartier was making a name for itself in providing these to French royalty. In 1874, when Alfred took over, he brought his three sons with him, Jacques, Louis, and Pierre. Now, these three sons are really the ones who made the name Cartier known. So today we're talking about Louis. Jacques had an incredible history of his own sourcing gems, being essentially an explorer of gemstones. And then we have Pierre, who also in his own right was, was a master of business. But we have Louis, who takes over the Paris office. We have Pierre, who goes to New York and starts the New York office in 1909. And then we have Jacques, who starts the London office in 1902. And it's these three branches of Cartier that make the name Cartier synonymous with luxury. So you were on Fifth Avenue in, in New York, you were on Rue de la Paix in Paris, and in London, you were equally in a high area. And this became the jewelry store to go to. It was the Maison you had places to go for these exceptionally crafted pieces that were pretty much all custom at this point. And out of the three brothers and out of the three houses, it can be argued that Louis is the most famous and credited with putting Cartier on the map. 
And one of the most famous Cartier designs, aside from the watch we're talking about today, is the Tutti Frutti. Uh, it consistently sells incredibly high at auction. It is spectacular in its craftsmanship, its colors, its gemstones, and its encapsulation of the time. These are incredible pieces, and Louis was the one who took Jacques' source stones and created these masterpieces with them. In addition to Tutti Frutti, he is the inventor, creator of the Santos watch, which we'll touch upon today, and of course, the tank, which we're going to talk about a little more. But to talk about all of this, we have to go back in history a little bit to place these all and give some context. So when Cartier opened in 1847, we were in, we were squarely 10 years into the Victorian era. Queen Victoria was the Queen of England from 1837 to 1901. And some hallmarks of the Victorian era were more traditional gender roles, prim, proper, everything was in its place and a little staid. So fashion, as you can see, was conservative, but also flashy, but not flashy by showing skin, flashy by showing jewelry. Um, this was a time of extreme wealth. The Victorian era was known in Europe as the Victorian era. In America, we are calling it the Gilded Age. So we have bustles, we have different outfits for each occasion of the day. There's a morning outfit, there's a going out to, on the streets outfit, there's an evening outfit, there's an opera outfit, there's a dinner outfit. All of these things were to be expected of society in the Victorian era. And one of these hallmarks was jewelry. So you'll see here, she has quite a bit going on. On her belt, she has a little purse. She also has a little pencil. Um, this showed her wealth. Jewelry was about showing your wealth during this time. Um, and they were exquisite pieces. And inspired by Queen Victoria, there were travels, there were diamonds. It was an incredible time. And one of the most notable things to come of this time is in 1873, Patek Philippe creates the first wristwatch. So this is, this is the Guinness World Record first wristwatch. And it's important to note that wristwatches were only for women. So they were called wristlets and they were jewelry items. They were not particularly functional. Um, they were just to be pretty, essentially. And Patek Philippe made this first one for the Countess of Hungary, and it is an incredible piece. And like I said, first wristwatch on record. But again, we're speaking of just women. When we move to men, we have this very proper coat, vest, hat, and watch and watch fob. You'll see the little fob on his stomach. Those all connected, and that was the only jewelry that was acceptable for men during this time. Sometimes they had some decorations or a love medallion hanging from their fob, which was completely acceptable. But due to societal pressure and of the times, these men during the Victorian era wore significantly less jewelry than anyone before them, than their ancestors. And it had to do with the idea of pretense. While in women it was okay and they wanted to show their wealth, men were just more reserved. So there is a pejorative term that was used in this time for men who wore belt buckles, shiny jewels, or um, rings, which is very interesting because we see all of those things today. Uh, and they were called dandies and looked upon as less uh, just very concerned about and fops and they were very concerned about their appearance which was deemed less um, important to society because if they're so worried about their appearance they are obviously not contributing so the men of this time took that very seriously and we see really the only decoration on men as pocket watches 
Now, what's very interesting about this is we are talking about Victorian England and pocket watches. This translates into war. These Victorian men went into war with pocket watches. You will see them here. These are officers seated. They have their pocket watches on them. And in particular, we are talking about the Boer War, which lasted from 1899 to 1902. This can arguably be called the first war of the 20th century because it spans that era and it sets us up for World War I. The Boer War was between Great Britain and two um, South African the South African Republic and the Orange Free State. And there had been gold discovered in South Africa, also colonialism. So the war was essentially a fight for independence and self-governance. In that war, the British brought 500,000 people and the Boers had about 80,000. However, this was terrain that the British were not familiar with. So the Boers had a tactical advantage in terrain, as well as they were using the newest rifles of the time. So the British, while having more people, struggled a bit, but then determined that if they come together and create a Defend an offensive, they would be able to win. And one of the things that helped them do that were planned coordinated attacks. The British soldiers in the Boer War took their pocket watches out of their pockets and jerry-rigged straps on them and attached them to their wrists, therefore making coordinated attacks much easier to see because they just flipped their wrist as opposed to having to pull out a pocket watch. While this is by no means the thing that won the war for them, it is worth noting that this is the first time we had this kind of coordinated timed attack being used in modern warfare. Uh, you'll see to the picture there, we have a soldier and these like leather straps. This is a little later. These leather straps started to come up after the Boer War because of the success of this. In 1902, the war was over. The Boers accepted a peace. They lost their bid for independence, but they were promised self-governance and efficient management of the gold mines. What comes out of this, though, is a different history that we're following, and it is the history of these jerry-rigged watches. Following that, we see the skirmisher and the campaign watch. These are advertisements from after the Boer War in about like 1903. And they are saying we had success in the war by this watch. It'll, it'll, it'll last you through a war. It'll get it for done for you. And then the skirmisher tells you that it's actually not just for war. It's for hunting, yachting, cycling, et cetera. But you will notice that these are still pocket watches. Uh, in particular, the one, the skirmisher is just a pocket watch in a leather strap. And that's what we have moving into the next century. We have this idea of utility and how do we use watches better, um, but it's still not a hundred percent catching on. You don't see many men walking around with pocket watches attached to their wrists because it's still not of the time uh, and still very proper to have your pocket watch, your vest and all of that. But as we move to the turn of the century, the end of the Victorian era, and we move into the Edwardian era, things start to change and shift. Everything becomes more modern. The Edwardian era lasts from 1901 to 1910, and it is marked by the Kitty Hawk and the Wright brothers in the United States in 1903. It is marked by the invention of the combustion engine, the internal combustion engine, and electricity is becoming more commonplace. Not everybody has it, but it's becoming more commonplace. And you still see 
men of the era with their pocket watches. They are a little less formal than we saw in the Victorian era, but they're still there, which leads us to Alberto Santos Dumont. He was a Brazilian aviator living in Paris and a friend of Louis Cartier. One day while they were at lunch, Alberto says to Louis, after he had just crashed one of his planes, you know, these are timed. Timing is very important in this. I don't have the time to take my pocket watch out, see what's going on while not trying to crash my plane. So in hearing this, Louis decides he is going to make a watch for his friend, Santos Dumont. But in thinking of this, he is very much of the Victorian era and does not want to make a bejeweled watch, um, much like what women would wear because that would embarrass his friend. And he would never do such a thing to such a person he, hides, he holds in such high esteem. So he sets to work to create a flat square bezel watch attached to a strap that Alberto can wear while he is flying. And on the bottom right, we do have an early iteration of this watch. It was a prototype that he gave Alberto, so we don't have the actual one. But there is an important note. Even though he didn't want it to be bejeweled, he wanted it to be functional. The jeweler in him just couldn't stop. And he put a sapphire cabochon on the crown of the watch, which we'll see later. And it becomes a hallmark moving forward. Um, what's important about Alberto Santos Dumont is that he is he was a contemporary of the Wright brothers, and it is argued that he is actually the first inventor of the plane. And in 1906, he won a French award for going the first to fly 100 feet, and he is wearing his watch in this, which led to a lot of questions. What do you want? What is strapped to his wrist? There was demand for this watch after, or any watches after the, the flight because Alberta was a very famous aviator, kind of a style icon in high society. Um, so Cartier as a marketing genius and to honor his friend, calls this watch the Santos, uh, but he doesn't release it immediately. Um, in the years between 1906, when he takes this flight and 1911, when he actually releases his first watch, Cartier is working on an exclusive partnership with Jaeger Lecoutre for these extra flat and accurate watch movements. Um, Jaeger ends up becoming its own brand, it is still to this day known for its exquisite pieces and exceptional um, movements. When, he de when Cartier debuted the Santos in 1911, there were a couple buyers. There was still um, enthusiasm for Alberto Santos Dumont, but the watch really doesn't, the wristwatch for men still doesn't take off for an another couple years. And it only does because of World War I. In 1914, we have the start of World War I. And we have a particular emphasis on France. Uh, France consists or makes up the Western Front. Germany invaded France through Belgium. And this campaign saw the deadliest battles of World War I, both in the Battle of Verdun and the Battle of the Somme. With modern weapons, small fields of battle, and trench warfare, this war has these these battles in particular have been described as intentional meat grinders and a ghastly human experience. And we see planes, which only 10 years before were the Wright brothers and Santos Dumont going 100 feet, now being used in action. But we also see more watches. So on the right, you will see a 1917 Elgin watch. And that was worn 
by American officers. You'll see it's still essentially a pocket watch, but it has shrapnel protection. That's what it was called. That's what it was there for, that cage on top of it. And then you'll see to the left that pocket watches were being repurposed and lugs were being attached. So soldiers could attach their own straps to them. So they don't have to buy new watches. They can just use the ones they have, but they'll be more functional. And this is really important as these battles, uh, this modern warfare continues. The need that we saw in the Boer War for planned timed attacks happens tenfold in World War I and even more beyond. And because of World War I and these watches, we also start to see them on actual soldiers. And we see them being advertised much in a propaganda way. Like he would love to wear this. If he's fighting, if you're fighting, or if you want to be like a soldier, you will wear this kind of watch. And it is really in this mentality that you see a change in the cultural norms and wristwatches on men start to become accepted, not just because they're practical, but because they are necessary at this point. And we have this great article from July 9th, 1916 about the status of the wristwatch where the New York Times officially says, it is no longer a silly ass fad for men to wear wristwatches. <laughs> and I think that just says everything about the gender norms of the time and how it takes a war to change the perception of a functional utilitarian item. The Cartiers are not immune to war. Louis is the only brother left in Paris at this point. Um, we have, remember, we have the other two in New York and London. So in 1914, when war breaks out, Louis reports to the war office, but due to a severely fractured leg from a car accident he experienced six years prior, he was unable to be a soldier on the ground and he was assigned a desk job in Bordeaux. The entire time he was on the job, he complained about the impossible journey to get back to Paris and his inability to contribute at the Maison, who is taking care of his store while he is riding the desk in Bordeaux. Um, Cartier survived. It, it continued to be open during the war. It just scaled back tremendously. Um, they were making smaller items that cost less, doing less of the ostentatious pieces. Um, scaling back, just, just it's wartime. No one is really distributed or displaying those incredible um, markings of wealth at this point. Um, as the war raged on, Louis received several different appointments uh, and assignments. And in 1916, he was confirmed to the Auxiliary Corps as a driver. During that time, he performed duties that took him all over the country, um, where according to him, uh, he took photos of soldiers. And he was a very prolific writer from the front um, and back home to everybody, his brothers. And one letter in particular was to the Grand Duchess Vladimir of Russia. He sends a photo and he writes, the soldiers seem to be more interested in having their photo taken than in the enemy. Uh, this, as we know, could not be further from the truth uh, but this was the truth and experience of the war from Louis's perspective. In one of his journeys to the front, Louis talks about when he comes home, he talks about seeing the Renault FT-17 tank pictured here. Uh, this tank was revolutionary and changed modern warfare as we know it. Uh, it also debuted on the battlefield in 1917, which is the same year that Louis was discharged because his knee and ankle injuries persisted and became a hindrance so he could no longer drive. These tanks served as Louis's next design inspiration, which leads us to the tank watch. 
So you can see from the drawing at the top and bottom, these are from the Cartier archives. Like the first Santos, we the first tank was a prototype. So we have the top drawing of what it should look like. And down below, we have inspiration from a tank. And you can kind of see the treads and you can start to see how it comes together and resembles what it's named after. So in 1917, Louis returns from the war and he debuts the tank watch. What's fascinating about this, again, is Louis's ability to grasp the idea of a marketplace. He calls this item the tank, but it is squarely a piece, a, a luxury good. It's made with 18 karat gold. It has a leather strap. Uh, again, it has the sapphire cabochon. These are, this is not a utility watch, but he has named it on the sensationalism of battle and this fervor that all the countries are in once the war ends. And again, in a, a stroke of genius, Louis sends the first prototype of the tank to General Pershing. And General Pershing was the commander of the American Expeditionary Forces in World War I. And the troops he commanded helped push back the German forces in key battles, which led to the Allied victory. To many, uh, especially here in the US, uh, he is the hero of World War I. But more than that, he is one of the most famous men in the world at this time. And he was gifted and wore Cartier's tank watch. I cannot think of any better marketing for that, and neither could Louis. During the next year, this is a, this is a tank from 1920 we have here. Uh, during the next year, which would have been 1919, only six tanks were produced. The annual production increased slowly. About 30 were made in 1920. And over the next 50 years, Cartier produced 5,829 tanks. It's roughly average. That, that averages out to about 100 tanks a year only until 1960. And then we ramp up production when we see an increase in demand. But these were very exclusive to start with. And the original tanks were gifted to Louis's friends who were members of high society. And then after that time, they became the accessory to have, essentially. We have... In 1926, we have two screenshots from the movie, The Son of the Sheikh, starring Rudolph Valentino. And it is said that he demanded in every scene to wear his tank. So we had General Pershing, who is one of the most famous global stars, um, war hero, decorated veteran. And then we move to Louis' friends starting to wear this and that high society in Paris coming back to Hollywood in like the golden age of cinema. Rudolph Valentino was the it star of the time. So the fact that he wore this meant the tank had made it and wearing it in every scene, even though it makes no sense in terms of his character um, is quite the demand to make. From there, we see it appear time and time again. 1932 on Clark Gable, 1930 on Duke Ellington, other celebrities to wear this. Gary Cooper, Fred Astaire, Cary Grant, Steve McQueen. Later, we have Carrie Fisher, Ingrid Bergman. Um, what's important to note as we move forward is that the tank snowballs into this cultural icon that is worn by everybody. And it is the watch to have starting in 1926, well, 1918 with General Pershing, 26, we see it on film, 32, it's continuing into film. In the 30s, we're venturing out of film, just but into other, other culturally significant entertainment areas. And that continues 
all the way through. And we end with Andy Warhol, who says, I don't wear a tank watch to tell the time. In fact, I never wind it. I wear a tank because it's the watch to wear. If that doesn't, <laughs> that is all we're talking about today is it becomes the it watch. Before that, we, we've already seen Jackie had a tank. JFK also had a tank. And he is reported to have said that the tank is France's greatest gift to America since the Statue of Liberty. In 1977, Cartier launches the must to Cartier line. It's a line of luxury goods at a lower price point. So while the tanks seen here in the photos and what we've been talking about are the solid gold tanks, the must line features um, gold plated. So they're 18 gold plated watches, which are with a more accessible price point. And they have colored faces. They have bolder faces, um, bolder dials, and that they are just a little more experimental than our traditional tank at this point. Um, last I read, the tank has over 41 styles, sizes, and finishes, making it the perfect unisex watch, which we continue to see through the history of celebrity. We have Muhammad Ali. We have Princess Diana. And then following that trend, we've seen them all on straps up till now, but it also comes on a bracelet. And we have Meghan Markle who just wore her tank on a bracelet to the Invictus Games in 2022. And bringing it full circle, we have the Met Gala, which happens the first Monday of May and the theme was Gilded Glamour. So we bring it back to the Gilded Age. We have Patrick Schwarzenegger, Oscar Isaac, and Sarah Jessica Parker all wearing tanks. And now I'd like a little to take a little closer look at the actual tank and how you can see the inspiration here. Uh, we were lucky enough to be gifted um, for use for today from the Chicago boutique. We have a tank to look at today. It is the small version in 18 karat yellow gold on a band. But, so this is the tank up close. Um, you can see these are called these are, per that drawing we saw, these are the treads on the side. You'll see that they, the lugs are incorporated. <clears throat> so it seamlessly enters the strap. You'll also note this sapphire cabochon here, present on all our tanks and Santoses. Uh, one feature that's really unique is the anodized steel hands, you'll see that they are blue, which is to harken back to that sapphire. And these tanks have a little secret. If you look very closely in the number 10, you will see that one of the slash marks is a regular painted slash, and the other is a secret hidden signature. What's most interesting about this in looking at it and learning its history is you can see how it was inspired. So you see these sides, they're the, the treads. And then when you look at it face on, it is exactly like that window that the soldier is looking out of because these are brancards, which are those window openings. So this whole watch, while based on a machine that came into war has become a staple of luxury worn for generations, decades, we'll say decades, by men and women alike as a symbol of status. And what Cartier did amazingly was change the utilitarian into luxury and 
by using and harkening back to the tank, he created this phenomena of must have and of survivalism through the worst and thriving in the best way from what was really a, a horrible and tragic war. He came out and created something. And to his original point, we have seen the evolution of that and that makes it a great idea. Um, I would like to thank you all for watching today. An extra special thank you to Cartier for loaning this to us. Um, and I am ready if anybody has any questions. I do see one um, about the price of, of tanks. Uh, they range. So we start with stainless steel and that's about $2,500 and it can go all the way up to 10,000 plus with uh, 18 karat gold. There have been some with diamonds. The tank must actually launch, relaunched last year with a price point of $2,700. Um, and if you want a must, they are available. I'm seeing another question. Um, so no, no, no Cartier watches were used in actual battle that we know of, like no. So the Santos obviously flew on the arm of Alberto Santos Dumont, but we don't know of the tank necessarily being used in war. The wartime watches were, as I showed you, they had the shrapnel and the shrapnel covers. Um, but those brands were Bell & Ross, Hamilton, Elgin, and they were made for durability and use rather than um, luxury everyday wear. So while Cartier did make pocket watches, it's possible one of those ended up on the battlefield before we transitioned. Um, and today we are using, I, I mean, there are aviator watches, there are submariners, there are, there are a ton that you are probably familiar with, Rolex, Breitling, um, Panerai. Those are all gonna be watches that have seen traditionally in the past seen battle and now have also skirted that line between luxury. Um, if we don't have any other questions. Thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, I want to shout out to the public libraries. We are a museum and library. Uh, the Cartiers where I got my initial inspiration is this great book by Francesca Cartier Brickell. Uh, she wrote about her grandfather and found these amazing documents and tells the story of the entire Cartier line. And this was my inspiration to talk about Louis and the Tank. Um, it's an amazing, amazing book. We also have just Cartier the Tank Watch. This is, a, this is also a really good book if you want to check it out at any point. Uh, this was from Chicago Public Library. I'm sure your local libraries have it too, or you can interlibrary loan um, from us here at the Pritzker if you're a member. Thank you so much to Cartier. Thank you for all of you joining us today to learn a little bit about, I dare I say, the more luxurious side of war. <laughs> um, I'm Kim, and I hope to see you again. Thanks. <laughs>